Hello and welcome to Partially Redacted. I'm your host, Sean Faulkner, and today I'm joined by Brian Val Alunga, CEO and founder of Doppler, and we'll be talking about secrets management. Brian, welcome to the show. Hey, super excited to be here. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. I was looking forward to this. Um, so you're the CEO and founder of Doppler. So I want to start there. Like, what is Doppler? Why did you start a company? Yeah, great question. So Doppler is a secrets management platform. Um, and a very high level TLD, TLDR is like pretty much any application that you have or piece of software has kind of three parts. Uh, there's code, there's compute, and there's secrets. And um, we have great tools today for uh, code like Git, uh, GitHub and GitLab. We have great tools for compute um, like AWS and GCP. And we don't really have much for secrets. And secrets are like API keys, database URLs, environment variables, configuration, things that are generally need to configure your applications in a very secure way. They're the keys to, um, uh, they're the keys that unlock your, uh, your services typically. Like if you're using Stripe, um, then you're going to need an API key. If you're using a, a database, you're going to need a database URL. Um, and so those, uh, types of secrets need to be managed in a secure way, and they need to be synchronized across all your development teams and your infrastructure. And that's exactly what Doppler set out to do. Mm -hmm. well, why do you think we've like overlooked that? We, you know, we have these great tools for, for compute, we have these great tools for you know, code management, but we haven't necessarily spent as much time building technology around secrets management. Because I think the problem shifts quite a bit. Like in the early, like when you're a really small startup, um, the biggest thing you notice is the productivity side of it, right? So like you'll start off with having like an ENV file, which is like a, a file that has the secrets literally um, in that text file, which is like really bad from a security lens, right? Because you have like unencrypted secrets on disk. Um, and then those secrets are then being copied and shared over Slack and email and all these other insecure places. Um, but they're doing that to solve the productivity issue. But as the company scales up, the problem actually shifts uh, both in ownership and in what the problem actually is to a security problem and an infrastructure problem. Um, the DevOps team commandeers that problem. They say, hey, we are the ones now responsible for managing secrets, um, and we need it to be synced with all of our infrastructure and all of our developers. Um, and then it also becomes a security problem because they need to be able to answer like three fundamental, pro uh, three fundamental questions. Where are all my secrets? Who has access to them? Um, and when were they accessed last, uh, which is like a, a two part question. And then what happens uh, if there's a breach? Can I stop the breach? Um, and so when that problem kind of shifts away, it's really hard to have like strong ownership around it. And so when you think about like a developer and like a lot of times I'd say dev tool companies are built by other developers, right? And so if they're very much focusing on the ENV file side, um, then they don't really feel this problem, then the tool doesn't get built. And so all the tools that really do exist uh, today are really built by security. Uh, like founders of uh, um, that, that have a security background. And so they build it for uh, security teams. But the problem is that security team or DevOps team may buy it, but then like all the entire developer base has to use it. And those developers don't like using it because it wasn't built for them. Um, yeah. And that's really where Doppler came in. It's like, let's build a tool for developers day one. Um, and that was our, our big insight there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that we see consistently when it comes to security that, if something is hard to use and you're sort of on the development side or even employees, like essentially you'll, you know, find amazingly creative ways to get around using that thing because it becomes like a barrier to be able to do your job, which is really the worst thing that can happen when we're talking about security, because you don't want people trying to like circumvent the, the guardrails that you've put in place. You're a hundred percent right there. Um, we have this theme that we kind of like build, into the DNA of the product and into the culture of the engineering and product teams or the EPD team of make vegetables taste like candy, right? Vegetables being the security, candy being the developer productivity. We want developers to, gen, to, to, to use this tool. And uh, the way you get them to use it is you get them to want to use it, right? And that comes from making them more productive every day. Um, and if they want to use that tool, then it's a win for the DevOps and security teams because they're like, holy crap, we can get uh, our developers to actually use the security tool and get the security win that we're in a way buying and trying to manifest. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. for anyone, uh, I think it may be worth like taking a step back and asking like, okay, why does this actually matter? Like what mm -hmm. we keep talking about like security and like when you talk about security, you're usually talking about managing risks. What are the risks here and like why does it all matter? I think is like a really important question that often gets overlooked with secrets management. Um, and the answer kind of stems back from data. Uh, 
I hear this all the time in the industry of like, oh, we have a terabyte of data or 50 gigabytes of data or whatever amount of data. And it's always seen from this lens of just data as like this uh, amorphous, ambiguous thing. When really, when we think about it, data is real people's data, right? Like if uh, all of us on this call and everyone listening probably use 50 to 100 services, Uber, Venmo, um, PayPal, Netflix, whatever it is, Twitch, YouTube, um, and all those services are storing and collecting our data. And that is the data that they refer to when they say they have X gigabytes or terabytes of data. And that data is our private data. And the thing that protects that data from getting out into the public or being used by hackers are these secrets, the keys to your digital kingdom. And that's why it's incredibly important for companies to protect these secrets. Um, and I would go as far as to argue that if they're not protecting these secrets, then it's negligence because they have a literal responsibility to, the, uh, to protect these secrets, to protect that private data and make sure that the private data stays private. Um, and that's why it all matters. And I can talk about if you want, like a story about how like a data breach actually personally impacted me and, what, and why that motivates me even more, if that'd be valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And I'd be also interested, and maybe this ties into that, is like what started sort of your path to founding Doppler? Like, what, how did you get interested in this problem in the first place? Yeah, so we started out, interestingly enough, not even thinking about Doppler as a security uh, platform, kind of like the classic uh, thing I was talking about around like the problem shifting. When, it, for, when Doppler first got started, uh, we were thinking, uh, so I was working on a previous uh, project at the time, a crypto machine learning marketplace. And uh, it, it's all the buzzwords in one. And basically it was one of these projects where um, it's like pushing a boulder up a hill. You move one foot forward and slip five feet back from exhaustion. It was just like terrible. I could not get this thing off the ground. Uh, funny enough, this this product did end up existing in the world. It's called Hugging Face now, and it's super successful. I just clearly was not the person to get this off the ground. And uh, there you go. There was a, like a founder product market fit problem. Um, but while running this project um, near the very end, I realized that I just wasn't going to be able to run. I wasn't be able to get it off the ground. And so I started looking at other problems I was facing. And managing environment variables and secrets was just one of them. And I just kept experiencing it again and again and again. Um, and so when we first got started, we looked at it from this viewpoint of like a developer productivity problem. And as we started to do more market research, we realized it was also a security and DevOps problem as well. And um, I would say most, uh, there's like a pretty even balance of pain. There's like lots of developers. And so if you sum up all that pain, that's quite a big pain point. And then separately to that, there's a huge DevOps and, and security pain as well that's really deep. Even though there's far, false, uh, far smaller teams, those teams have really deep problems because they're responsible for all of the data in the company and all of the infrastructure in the company. Um, and that's kind of how the idea was born. Was we, st we did a lot of market research and we were like, okay, it's very clear, and I resonate with this personally, that uh, there's this developer productivity problem to solve, but there's also this DevOps and security. And so how do we build a product that meets all the needs of all three? And that's really where the idea got born out of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's interesting when you start to like look at a problem under a new lens, like this isn't purely like a security problem, this is a developer productivity problem. I think like identity kind of went through a similar yes. like transformation, right? And there's still like tons and tons of companies that are continually making identity like an easier thing, like, you know, uh, uh, authentication, like an easier thing for developers to do. It's all about like developer productivity. And that really shifts, I think, the way that you think about like designing a product and it influences the types of investment that you're gonna make versus this is purely a security product. We're going to focus on like, how do we make this as secure as possible, but not necessarily like, how, is this thing usable? <laughs> do people yeah. want to use it? And if it's not usable, guess what? Developers care the most about their productivity and they will not use that tool. They will actively find a way to not use that tool. And I saw it firsthand at many companies I've worked at. Um, and I think uh, going back to like this other thing I was talking about before around um, why does it all matter, right? Like this data. Um, I can share like a real story about like how this kind of like, why, why secrets management matters and why it matters not just to the people that are buying it and deploying it and using it, but also the everyday person, the, the, uh, your parents and your friends. Um, so uh, I live in Austin, Texas, and I convinced my mom to come and join me out for a barbecue one day. We're at this barbecue restaurant. I get this call and it's, um, it's someone claiming to be from Texas uh, Customs and Borders. And they're like, hey, we have this package that's in your name. And it uh, has illegal drugs and money in it. Um, and we are now investigating you for this uh, for this uh, potential crime. 
Um, and we want to verify that you are who you say you are. So they started listing off all this information, information that like should not be out there in the public, right? Like this is private information and it was their, their way of basically validating who they say they are. Um, and this information later on, I found came from multiple data breaches, Equifax data breach that happened, um, and a couple others. And so I started building trust with this person. I was like, okay, this is a real investigator. They gave me case numbers and all this stuff. And it wasn't until we got the lawyers on the call and I started like probing deeper with the, with the investigators that we realized this was an entire scam. And not only was it a scam, but they actually got more information out of me through this call that can now be used for later attacks. And so the thing to, to realize here is not like one data breach is isolated. That data breach is going to expose data that can be then used to get more data out of you. And eventually to like a really big thing, like you wake up one day and there's no money in your bank account. Right. Because they had all the security questions and they had your password and maybe even somehow like hi hijacked your, uh, your your cell phone for like 2FA, which is very possible for what it's worth. Hackers are very, very good at, at doing that, like routing text messages. Um, and so this all comes to the point of like everyone is impacted by this um, from me to everyone else. And what motivates me about this is to stop data breaches from happening, to keep people's data secure. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think. Unfortunately, many of us have like similar stories where, you know, if it's not us directly, it's someone in our family that's gone through these types of exploits that happen. And they're unfortunately extremely common uh, now, like everyone's sort of affected by it in some way. And you mentioned the Equifax data breach, very famous data breach, massive amount. But those things now is like a, you know, regular <laughs> weekly occurrence for some sort of major organization. Just check the, you know, Google News on a Monday and you'll see the, the list of the various data breaches that have happened. In terms of um, you know protecting secrets or even thinking about like secrets management, like you know, I think there was a time when you know passwords we used to store in a database, even in plain text, like you know, twenty years ago, and we have gone through a transformation in terms of how we manage passwords and identity and stuff like that. Like, wh why is it that the tools that we've sort of developed for password management? don't help serve the needs of, of secret management? Like how is that sort of, how are those two worlds sort of like different that warrant different types of technology? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think it comes down to a couple things. One uh, very important note, passwords are scoped to the individual, right? So like if I have a password for Netflix or to Salesforce or something else, that is my personal login. And so if that gets breached, it's only to me. Secrets work differently. Um, if the Stripe API key gets out or the, or the database URL gets out, that is the entire database. That is the entire Stripe account that has every customer's bank account and credit cards in it. Um, and so the way that these kind of secrets are organized is very different than passwords, right? Because they're not really scoped to human beings. They're scoped more to projects and environments. Like you may have like a backend project and that backend project may have a development, staging and production environment and maybe things in between. Um, so how products or sorry, how secrets are organized is very different. The second part is how they're used. Um, in passwords, you really just need like a, uh, a browser extension and like a mobile app, right? So basically, if you have those two things, you can pretty much uh, get use your passwords anywhere you need them. With secrets, it's very different. You need a, um, a command line tool that injects secrets in local development so that your application can boot up with those secrets in the environment. You need infrastructure tooling where it directly writes into Kubernetes or AWS or GCP or Azure um, or any other cloud provider and then keeps those secrets in sync. So when they change, um, you, uh, you can automatically propagate that out to all of your infrastructure and have a guarantee that all of your infrastructure has the most updated secrets. Because remember, if you're off by just one secret and even just one character in that secret, that's an outage, guaranteed. That's a promise I can make you. Um, and then the other part is like, what happens when things change, right? Like um, a developer may be responsible for getting uh, a new service stood up. And through that, they need to get a new secret into production, but they also don't have access to production. And so you have this problem of like, okay, well, how does a developer get access to production to get this secret in? while also not seeing all the other secrets that they shouldn't have access to. Um, and that's where things like pull requests or change requests, um, we call them change requests at Doppler, come into play. And so there's tooling around that of where a developer can put up a secret, and then another person who has access to production can basically pull that secret into production. Um, and so there's a lot of tooling that needs to happen. And then throughout that entire stack, you need a very strong permissioning and audibility story. You need to be able to say, these set of developers have access to these set of secrets. And you need to be able to, be able to build an audit trail that says every single time they read every single version of secret on what machine, on, uh, on, 
uh, at what time period with what IP address and so on and what other metadata um, and put that all into your logging platform to be able to run analysis to see if there's any like sketchy things that went, that went, uh, that happened. Um, and so it's just a very different set of constraints and requirements, even though the, the kind of like, if you bring it down to its most like simple form, it's like you have sensitive data that needs to be encrypted, but then all the layers on top of that are different. Yeah. Like the, I think the the key there is the rules of engagement are fundamentally different. So yes, you could put a secret in a database with field level encryption. You got the encryption piece, but then it's like, well, how do you control access? How do you um, you know rotate those keys? How do you uh, make it so someone can insert, but uh, only insert, and and other people can read, or it's only a service that can read? Like all of these things are fundamentally different than on other types of data. And in the password world as well, if like I'm building a SaaS application, so I'm building some sort of application, I'm managing passwords for my customers. It's okay for me to destroy the password through like salting and hashing. I can't destroy a secret because fundamentally a secret has to be used in order for me to talk to like a third party service. So I can't just salt and hash it and <laughs> use essentially the same you know, data protection methods. So you know that you have to store that uh, securely, but you need to be able to use the key securely as well, which is also very, very different than a password. And quick reminder there as well, that with a password that you can destroy, that's just for one account versus a secret that you can't destroy is for all accounts that are in the database or in, or, uh, or all of your customers. So um, there's just much greater risk associated with that too, which is why like secrets rotation is super important. And for anyone listening, rotation is basically the idea of swapping out the locks on a cadence. So um, for example, like a, an analogy I like to use is like you have a key and a lock on your door on your home. And if you go out into the world and you lose that key, uh, and but you have another set, then there's some stranger that could walk into your, <laughs> into your home someday because they have that key. Um, and what rotation does is it says every 30 days or whatever cadence you want, it could be even daily, we're going to swap out the locks and issue new keys. And we're going to do it in a safe way that doesn't cause any downtime or any outages. Uh, so that way, if you do lose a key one day, it unless they come running home and find uh, that single day, that key is invalid anymore and, and doesn't work. Um, and it's a very great way, uh, a very strong way to uh, increase the security posture around your secrets. Yeah, so how does Doppler handle that in such a way that you can swap the key, but you don't have essentially downtime in a situation where there's a new key in place, but it hasn't actually propagated to all services? So there's two parts that are running uh, to, that, that work together. The first is we use a two key system. Um, and so what that means is for any service, there is a primary and a secondary and both are valid. And so let's just say you have, you say, I want to rotate my secrets every 30 days. At the halfway mark, so on the 15 day mark, we generate a new credential. We take the primary and put that as a secondary and the new key becomes the primary. So the old key still is valid for another 15 days. Um, and then the second part is propagation. We make sure that the new primary credential is propagated um, across your entire infrastructure. And we have guarantees that that uh, infrastructure is using those new secrets. Um, and so those two things together guarantee a no, uh, a no downtime experience. Mm -hmm. And in, in terms of like Doppler in comparison to things like HashiCorp Ball or AWS Secrets Manager, like how, how do those services compare to what you're doing? Uh, so I, I'd say let's separate them into two groups. Mm -hmm. There are our comp uh, direct competitors, which would be like HashiCorp Vault, um, Aculus is another one. And really both Aculus and HashiCorp Vault are basically the same thing. They are... Um, so there's two types of secrets out there. There are data secrets, which is like um, PII information, medical information, things that are like related to the user uh, that need to be secure. And then there are application secrets and infrastructure secrets. And that's the world that we deal in. And so HashiCorp Vault um, and Aculus were largely made for data secrets. They are like key value data stores that can get quite big um, and you can put any arbitrary data in it. Um, but they're not really made for application and infrastructure secrets. They don't really have all the tooling that is needed there. Um, and then we sit on the other side where we, we specialize in application infrastructure secrets. And so where you're going to find the differences between the two is that we are far more designed for the developer and that developer experience. We're going to work far better uh, and more uh, with your infrastructure because we have native integrations for all of the major cloud providers and Kubernetes um, and pretty much SDKs for, for most languages. Um, so you just have a far richer experience with Doppler if you're trying to solve the application and infrastructure secrets um, problem. Now, the other side is the cloud providers uh, like AWS Secrets Manager and Prime Restore. Um, and we consider them partners. 
we actually have native integrations with all of them. And I would say a vast majority of our customers con continue to use them. So the classic story we'll see is they're using AWS Secrets Manager in production today, and that's it. Uh, so they basically know where all their production secrets is, but they don't know where all the other secrets are. And they have no way of coordinating secrets even in production. They just kind of like copy and paste it manually. Mm -hmm. And they'll come in and we'll basically import all those secrets from AWS into Doppler. We'll set up syncs so that anytime they change in Doppler, they now change in AWS Parameter Store and Secrets Manager, which also means that they don't have to do any recoding on their side to fetch uh, secrets differently in production. Whatever's working in production today continues to work, and we're just adding a layer on top. And then we provide tooling for all the other environments like CICD, testing, um, local development, and we give them a better con uh, ability to manage access controls. Instead of every engineer needing access to AWS Secrets Manager or Parameter Store, now only the DevOps team does because all other access controls are managed through Doppler. So now mm -hmm. they're even great, uh, uh, are able to greater, uh, follow least privileged access at a stronger level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if I want to get started, like what, what's that process look like? Like how do I essentially start moving from whatever I'm doing today to using something like Doppler? What's the integration process? Very quick for most companies. I mean, we have companies as big as uh, top four accounting firms that have like tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of developers getting up and running in like two months. Uh, and those are extremely large and, uh, organizations. And then we have startups that are like 10, 20 people that get up in like one hour to two hours. Um, and so both paths kind of lead the same place. Um, create an account on Doppler. It's free. It's easy. We don't require a credit card when you're signing up. Um, and then from there, we'll basically ask you a set of questions like, where, where are you currently integrating today? Where, where does your infrastructure live? And through that, we'll just start setting up syncs and those syncs will start importing those secrets in and then uh, create a, a live sync from there that will basically make sure anytime they change in Doppler, they change in your infrastructure as well. Um, and that's the nuts and bolts of it. It's pretty quick setup. Um, the biggest, I think, thing is really like getting those projects prioritized. That's usually see, uh, what we see is like the slowest part of the process is uh, saying, OK, we're going to put it in this sprint cycle and the sprint cycle starts now. Yeah, at what point does this become something that is like an acute pain point for businesses? Like, is it essentially when you get to a certain size in terms of like your engineering organization or maybe in terms of like, uh, you know, lifetime of the product being being out there with real customers? Um. I would say after usually 10 engineers, it starts to become a productivity problem. Mm -hmm. And then usually I find when they, when a company hits their series B and above, um, they've achieved enough success in the business where now it's worth protecting that success. Um, so a good way to kind of like frame the problem in like, do I have a problem? And um, if you can't answer these three questions strongly and confidently, you have a problem in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, the three questions are, uh, which I already shared earlier, but I'll repeat again, is do I know where all my secrets are? If you don't know where all your secrets are, there is no possible way you can protect them, right? Uh, if secrets are scattered across developers' laptops, production, CIC, testing, and God knows where else, a bunch of emails and Slack messages, you really have no way to, to manage these secrets and 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 um, and govern them and, ma and manage the risks associated with them. The mm -hmm. second question is a combo, which is, do I have the ability to set up access controls across all of my secrets? And do I know when those secrets have been read? So do I have a strong permissioning and auditing story around my secrets? And the third is when a data breach does happen. And I think most, uh, most people, especially the ones in charge of managing secrets, should consider it a when, not an if. That way, when it does happen, they're prepared. Um, is can I stop a data breach when it's happening? When hackers are in your system, can you stop the attack? And if you cannot do that confidently or any of those confidently, then you guaranteed have a problem that should be solved. And then use Doppler for what it's worth. Just solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I think the first step is uh, acknowledging you have the problem, right? So, yeah. I mean, it's very similar to um, even, you know, the company I work with for uh, Skyflow, where we're really focused on uh, PII, you know, customer data management. And it's similar, like, like if you don't know where your customer data is, then how how can you possibly protect it? How can you control exactly. access? It's, it's the same exact problem. It's like all over the place. You know, maybe it's not in Slack, but it's probably in a spreadsheet somewhere as well as, uh, you know, your Salesforce and your various data stores and so forth. So, like, just getting a handle on that picture is is really hard for most companies and most companies don't have any idea where it is yeah most companies have no clue and i think the other scary part is like there are 
especially with secrets management, there, there, I feel like there's a, like a lot of delayed bombs that can go off. For example, um, I'll give you two that like happen quite frequently, more frequently than they should. Um, companies using contractors, contractors ask for an API key over email. They share it over email and now it's buried in that thread. Then months later, uh, some other person gets involved and they share that thread with someone and 20 emails deep is an API key that now someone has access to happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Another one company is building an open source tool, but they're building it um, in a private repo to start. Um, and, or they actually are building just a private product that, that is never intended to be open source and they have their secrets in the in code. And then they decide at some point, we're going to open source it. We're going to be good Samaritans to the internet. Um, and they go and they remove all the secrets uh, from the code and then they open source it. But what they forgot is that those secrets are still in the code. They're just in the, in the Git history. Um, and there are bots that are designed to scan every public repo um, in seconds throughout the entire history of that repo and find those secrets. And it happens incredibly quickly. Like within seconds of a, of a repo going open source, the attack will start. Um, and that's a very, very common occurrence. And if they were using, even if they were just using an EMB file, which I'm still very against, but if they were using that alone, that would still be a big step in the right direction because it's not directly in code now. It's configured by the environment. Yeah. Yeah. And it's easier to create like a, 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 a rule in your get ignore to not commit that essentially to your. Exactly. exactly. Um, yeah. And like there's been some famous uh, breaches that have happened from weak secrets that were part of uh, someone's like public repo that happened by accident. These type of things happen. Like, but in terms of data breaches, like we, we've talked a little bit about this, but there's, you know, in, in this year alone, we've essentially caught up to the number of data breaches that happened in 2023, and we're only you know five months in. And then 2023, I think there was over 2,000 more data breaches last year than any other time in history. So this problem's not going away; it's getting worse. How much of that is related to poor secrets management? It's really hard to tell because companies don't really talk about it publicly. But I I think that there is an underlying like logical strategy that happens with, with hackers that I've seen as a pattern across all of them, um, which is they just go for the weakest link, right? And so if you have a really weak firewall, they're going to go after that. If you have really, really weak email post, uh, email po uh, security posture, they're going to go after that. A lot of times, uh, most companies have tools in place for most of those, those things. They have great firewalls because they kind of come included in AWS. You have great email uh, security now just off the bat with Google. Um, but Secrets is like one of the few places that isn't... Um, heavily invested in. And so if there's a weak link, they're going to attack the weak link. It, it just like logically makes sense for them to take the easy win and they're going to do it. Um, and a lot of times they can also do it through like code. Like I think Twitch is a great example uh, of the data breach that happened, right? It wasn't that secrets, it wasn't like some, there was some malicious actor in the company that like stole the secrets. It was, they hacked the code base and they got the code and in the code had the secrets, right? Um, and so if they had a secrets manager, then it, it would have been a far less scary uh, data breach. It would have just been our code got out, big whoop, right? Um, versus all of our data and code got out. Now it's very scary. Um, and so a lot of times there's these ripple effects where like the weak point could be the code layer, but when that gets breached, it then ripples into secrets and then secrets are the keys to every other system, which means now they just got access to everything. Um, and so it may not be like a one punch attack. It may be a one, two or one, two, three attack before the whole castle falls down. Um, and that's why it's really important to have secrets management because it may not, it, it, it may, it may, the first strike may not always land, but that doesn't mean there are other strikes that aren't coming. <laughs> and are, you know, this is, feels like, like a classically sort of overlooked, uh, problem within a company or maybe something that like you mentioned earlier, like it, it's like, when do you prioritize it for a sprint? And it's something that's kind of easy to be like, oh, well, you know, we'll deal with that later. We'll deal with that later. And then it becomes like a, a major problem. But are you seeing a shift uh, from the time that you've been in the space of companies like recognizing that they need to prioritize this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, huge. I mean, it's it's honestly refreshing to see. Um, yeah, we have uh, a number of extremely large uh, companies that are using us and also our competitors, like for what it's worth. I mean, hey, I want to stay competitive in the market with our competitors too. Don't get me wrong, but I just also want the problem fixed. I want all the data breaches to go away for me and for everyone else. Um, and it's really refreshing to see more and more companies do, uh, using this. I think both security teams are becoming more aware of it. They're starting to have more conversations and compliance bodies, right? Like I think that's really going to be the next big unlock is when NIST 
Um, because NIST is like the kind of like root uh, compliance body that kind of sets the terms for like SOC 2 and everything and ISOs and all the rest. When NIST says, hey, we need you need proper secrets management, the entire industry overnight is going to get uh, fixed. Um, I, and so I think we're slowly starting to see that happen. Um, and you, you like we're seeing the early adopters and like early mid adopters right now. Um, and we just need to work our way to the late stage adopters. So do you see that is sort of the where the industry is maybe moving towards is that we're going to have uh, more essentially uh, introduce regulation around the, oh, the, the secrets, similar to like credit card handling. Like, you know, yeah. everybody who's handling credit cards knows that they need to be PCI compliant. And it's very clear about what the rules are. And you can go to a vendor and offload that. And essentially secrets is kind of moving in that direction. I think so. Yeah. I mean, we're already seeing it in a couple of compliance bodies today, like FedRAMP is it's in there. Uh, right. It's in, I believe, I forgot what the name is, but there's a compliance body for like dealing with the military. Um, so like the government clearly knows that it's a needed thing, right? Uh, it just hasn't hit NIST yet. And I think anyone who is listening onto this has connections to NIST should probably deeply think about, uh, think about this. And if they want, they can reach out to me. It's brian at dalper.com, B-R-I-A-N at dalper.com. Um, and uh, we're actively looking into this and, and trying to strategize around this too. Um, and we're willing to work with our industry, including our competitors, to make this happen because I think this is like a, um, uh, uh, what is it, rising tide lifts all boats kind of thing. Like yeah. this will improve the security posture of uh, uh, the U.S. economy and maybe even the global economy if we can pull this off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it, how does like the protection of keys actually work? Like it's it's great to sort of offload responsibility to a vendor for protection, but and through this like shared service model, but how do I know that they're safe? Like what sort of, uh, you know, technologies are, are required to actually protect the keys? Yeah, a lot of things go into it. Um, so I, I think one thing with, uh, with security, it's like, with security, you kind of have to like cover all the bases, right? And then like an attacker basically has to find like one crack in the system. So there are, there's a lot of things that go into this. I'm not gonna be able to like spend the entire call on it, but I think that the nuts and bolts of it uh, is quite simple, um, which is when secrets enter our system, we immediately tokenize it. And the process of tokenization is basically um, encrypting those secrets with um, a key that is scoped to that, uh, to that, um, to that company. And then uh, some some of our customers, our enterprise customers, want to take it a step further, and they want to say we want to use our own encryption keys to uh, to to encrypt the data, and we call that enterprise key management. They can set it up in like three button clicks, um, and then what we'll do is we'll we'll double encrypt the secret. So we'll encrypt it one time with our encryption key, and then we'll encrypt it a second time with their encryption key, um, and then that gets stored in our tokenization service that is. Um, not connected to the internet. It's isolated from other systems. It's uh, a go binary. Um, so it's, and it has no dependencies. Um, so it's very, very locked down. Like you'd have to hack go and then have multiple layers of, of our infrastructure just to get access to it. And there's only one way you can communicate with it. So it's extremely locked down. Yeah. So it's like supply chain attacks essentially. Yes, exactly right. And also like, let's just say someone and, and, and also worth noting that the rest of our infrastructure only uses those tokens, those IDs that reference that secret. Uh, so let's just say our dashboard got hacked, or our like API server got hacked. Those don't have the secrets. And unless you can get like three orders, uh, uh, three layers deeper, um, you really won't be able to get to those underlying secrets. Um, another thing we do, very small thing, but it's very powerful, is we ensure that all the traffic, uh, the web traffic from either to the dashboard or to the API or any or anything else, uh, is authenticated through um, the. It's coming from the right place. You can't hit our servers directly. You have to go through Cloudflare. And so when you go to Doppler.com, that is uh, that DNS is hosted through Cloudflare. We do a lot of security stuff at the DNS layer, um, and then uh, when that request gets then proxied into our servers. Uh, we actually check cryptographically that it came from Cloudflare. And then Cloudflare cryptographically checks that the response came from us with the right set of signatures um, before it then sends it back to the customer. So there's like lots of checks all the way up and down the stream um, outside of just the encryption of the keys themselves. Yeah, so it's like you, even if an attacker breaks down the first wall, there's like 10 more walls essentially to try to break through. Yeah, there are a lot of walls. A lot of them are managed by Cloudflare. A lot of them are managed by our infrastructure providers. And then a lot of them are managed by us. And so you really need to like, it would need to be a very sophisticated coordinated attack um, for this to, to work. And even then you still need to get access to tokenization service, which is a binary completely off, uh, off the internet with no dependencies and a very, very strict protocol on how to get access to it. 
Awesome. Makes, makes, makes a ton of sense. So, you know, as we, we start to kind of wrap up here, like what's next for, for Doppler and what do you think the, the future of, uh, you know, secrets management looks like? Yeah. Great question. Um, so I think there's two things. I think these are kind of like combined questions really, because we see Doppler as like, um, the company leading the charge on the secrets management uh, industry, right? So what we do, we kind of try to like set it, set an example for the rest of the industry. And we're seeing that for what it's worth. Like our competitors are starting to become a little bit more developer friendly because we, we were the first one to, to introduce that. Um, I think two things, one on, com- on the compliance side, it's our mission to make it part of the NIST uh, compliance body, because we, if we do that, it'll ripple into SOC 2 and all the ISOs. Um, so I, we're going to be working diligently on that on the product side. Um, we're seeing right now with passwords that passwords are going away and pass keys are coming in. We're moving to an, more an identity-based authentication uh, model. And you will see the same thing happen with secrets. Uh, we actually call it identity-based authentication. The idea is just by the fact that you are in a Kubernetes pod or uh, an EC2 instance in AWS, uh, those, those instances have identities within Kubernetes or AWS uh, or both. Um, and you can pair those identities with Doppler. And so just by the fact that you're in that machine, you're now automatically authenticated to Doppler. So that's part one of the identity network. The To make it a true network though, we also know, need to build identity authentication with all of the providers you use. So the like golden standard of what we're trying to get to is if you're in an EC2 or in a Kubernetes pod, you're now automatically authenticated to Stripe because you have an identity with Doppler and Doppler has an identity with Stripe. Um, and we'll do this with all the rest. And so the, the, our goal is to eventually transition us into a secretless future. Yeah. And that way, that way basically, like and you, you have to get access to like the EC2 instance running within the pod in order to uh, essentially hack the system because having external access isn't going to allow you to authenticate. Correct. And you need to be able to know how to authenticate through Doppler to that. Like there's, there's other layers of checks along the way. It's versus like if you like with secrets, there's like this scary thing of like, you get access to a system, you, you copy or you download the secrets and they have infinite time until those secrets are rotated to do something with it. You have a lot of time to figure out how to use those secrets to, to cause harm uh, versus identity. You have to be in that machine and, and, and in a live execution environment to be able to leverage those identities and be able to communicate in the right way. And so you don't have a lot of time to figure those things out. You really need a very, very targeted uh, strategic strike, which is like orders of magnitude harder. Right. Yeah. And in, in back to like one of the questions that you talked about, where if you are going through a data breach, you can shut down the data breach. That makes it much easier to shut down the data breach because yeah, you're exactly. like active within the system, essentially. So you just shut down the active server and suddenly the, the breach goes away. And you could do really interesting things like we were exploring this a, a little bit, a conversation inside Doppler. I mean, obviously, we're pretty far off from this, but like I would love to go as far as saying like we can track what processes should be using those identities. And if the process that is um, if a process that isn't authorized to use that identity is using that identity, we flag it and shut down the identity and then rotate the ones, uh, the identities that should be used by the right process. And we just manage all that seamlessly. So there's no downtime. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> that's a, very exciting. Really cool stuff. Well, Brian, I want to thank you so much for being here. This was really, really fascinating. Uh, I love the stuff that you're doing. I feel like the stuff that you're working on is very sort of aligned with our, our our vision at Skyflow in terms of how we think about like customer data and PII, which is another form of a sensitive you know sensitive data. Um, and uh, I think we're sort of um, you know moving in, hopefully moving the industry in the right direction. Yeah, I think we are. And if you ever want to work together on getting NIST uh, to have secrets management and PII data um, as part of the compliance body. Uh, love to partner with you on it. Great. But yeah, let's uh, let's uh, explore that for sure. All right. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.